I'm going to then talk about the interactive case. So here we are. The answer is coming, and uh, something is known about the interactive case. Let me just very quickly uh, repeat this. So where we almost all start our teaching of the crypto course is Alice and Bob, they want to exchange a key. What we often don't say in the basic crypto course is that it's not just Alice and Bob out there. There are lots of people out there. So, um, and, and this is a problem because we have lots of security proofs that work very well for two people, but when you mix in lots of people, we get lots of trouble, as we shall see. Uh, let's just remind ourselves what are the properties of key exchange? What does the, what is the adversary allowed to do? So the adversary, first of all, he directs everyone because we're trying to give the adversary as much power as possible and to get as much power as possible, well, uh, we have to allow him to do everything that could conceivably give him an advantage without making his work too easy, uh, without these trivial queries that we talked about in the previous session. So he directs every honest user, he can inspect keys, and then he gets the real key, or he can test keys, and this is the real random query, that's where he earns his money, so to speak. Uh, he controls the network, of course, and he can also adaptively corrupt users, and this is what really causes trouble for us. Um, also, let's just remind ourselves what our goal is. Well, we want authenticated key exchange, and I've tried to render it into English, and some of you can probably find some corner cases where this is wrong. Never mind. Once we have a security notion, what we next want is a security proof. We want to prove that our scheme is secure, and this usually takes the form of a reduction. Why do we want security proofs? And there are, well, we had this slide uh, in the previous talk too. Uh, the first mathematical answer is why not? It's interesting. Uh, the second, and some people actually uh, use this as an argument, if we have a security proof, we know that the adversary in some sense has to tangle with the mathematical problems underlying our key exchange, so we haven't really messed up. Okay, and the third reason you might want to give is that the security proof is going to help us uh, choose security parameters. Because we know that, uh, and then, this just saying that we have a polynomial time, blah, 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 it doesn't really help us. We need to be a bit more concrete. So we get this, if you have an attacker with advantage t, uh, sorry, uh, using time t with advantage epsilon, blah, blah, blah. And this we can then use to decide security parameters. And then, as the previous talk mentioned, if we can have a tight reduction a tight reduction is one where the, uh, we don't get a loss of advantage or an increase in time by running the reduction. Then we can probably have smaller keys and that might result in effect, more effective systems if you actually believe in this provable security and want to use it to uh, choose security parameters. Of course, today no one does, so, well. But anyway. Uh, Let's just yet again remind ourselves what is Diffie-Hellman. Why do we care about Diffie-Hellman? Well, because we're going to make Diffie-Hellman better. Uh, you thought that wasn't possible, but just wait. So we all know Diffie-Hellman, and in a very simplified case, we can say that the adversary is going to promise not to tamper with any messages, and he's also telling us in advance which users he has corrupted. And then we can do a very nice reduction from, um, to prove that this Diffie-Hellman key exchange is actually secure. So what we do is, if Carol, which, we want, which Alice wants to talk to, is corrupt, then you just run the Diffie-Hellman key exchange as usual. Why? Well, because you have no expectations of privacy for this key. Because uh, Carol, you, the one you're talking to, is corrupt, so who cares? However, if you're talking to an honest Bob, then you just pick out a Diffie-Hellman tuple, you use the X and the Y as your messages back and forth, and then you use the third or the fourth element of the Diffie-Hellman tuple as your key. And as 
uh, Lisa just explained, Diffie-Hellman says the real uh, Diffie-Hellman tuple is indistinguishable from a random tuple. So you can't tell the real key from a random key. And this, well, then we have security. And all is very nice. And we also have this other beautiful property of Diffie-Hellman uh, uh, tuples. They're re-randomizable. So if I have one tuple, I can very easily create a huge amount of them. And what happens then? Well, for every conversation between two honest people, I can just pick out a new random tuple from my re-randomizations, and I get lots of keys that are all either real or all either random. And this is very nice. We get a tight security proof. Of course, we haven't allowed adaptive corruptions. We haven't allowed the adversary to mess with the messages. So this is too easy. What happens, and now we're going to, the adversary still promises not to tamper with messages, but now he's allowed to adaptively corrupt. That means he doesn't have to tell us in advance who he's going to corrupt. So now the adversary tells, uh, tells Alice, I want you to talk to Carol. And he hasn't yet corrupted Carol. So now our reduction, which is us trying to trick the adversary into solving Diffie-Hellman for us or some other interesting thing, we have to decide on a message to Carol. We have to decide first. The adversary who can do adaptive corruption, he gets to decide later whether or not to corrupt Carol. Which means we have to commit to something before the adversary choose, makes his choice. We have a commitment problem. Um, and this, one might ask, uh, why is this a problem? Well, because we have to commit first, we can't, we can't use the strategy we just used. Because that strategy depended on if Carol was dishonest, we chose our message as G to some exponent. If Bob was honest, we chose our message as something coming from a Diffie-Hellman tuple. Now, when we don't know if Carol is going to be honest or dishonest by the time she gets this message, well, I can choose something from a Diffie-Hellman tuple, but if Carol then turns out to be corrupted, I can't find the key. So I don't know what the key is. And that's a problem. And the same way, if I say, oh, he's bound to corrupt Carol, because that always happens, um, what if he doesn't? Well, then I've chosen G to the A, and then I have no reasonable expectation that my key is going to be random looking. So this is the commitment problem. We have to commit before the adversary uh, has to commit to corrupting. Now, the standard strategy when you want to do a proof like this is you simply guess, like the last talk mentioned, you simply guess a pair and you put your Diffie-Hellman tuple into that pair and if it goes wrong, well then it goes wrong, but with a certain non-negligible probability it goes right, but we don't get a tight proof. We get this loss of n square and that's bad. So we want to do something really simple and this is really simple. This is what we do. What we do is we just hash the first message, and then we don't send the first message, we send the hash. And then the hash goes to Carol, who then replies, and only when Carol has replied do we send the real message. The point is that we only send the real message once we know whether or not the one who replied is honest or not. And in the random oracle model, this means we don't have to commit. Because in the random oracle model, we can reprogram our hash. So we don't have to choose the message. We just have to choose the hash value. And once we know what we want the hash value to be, then we can just reprogram the hash oracle. And in this way, we get a beautiful, tight little reduction. And that's kind of nice. Of course, 
Um, some of you will then complain, now we have a different protocol. It's not as nice as Diffie-Hellman because really uh, Bob here, who now gets the message, he gets a hash and in the ordinary Diffie-Hellman, once he gets that hash, he holds, once he gets the first message, he also gets the key. But in our protocol, he doesn't get the key. He has to first send his message back and then he has to wait until the message from Alice arrives, and only then is he able to compute his key. So there is an increased latency for Bob. There is also a bit of extra things you have to transfer back and forth. Uh, but remember, this is often not a problem because, uh, frankly, you're often transferring some, something like signatures and stuff. So very often Diffie-Hellman ends up being a three-move protocol anyway. Um, the thing is, and this is kind of nice, if you actually look at what's the likely result of using Diffie-Hellman, if you use a small-scale system, then likely, you're likely to actually bump your uh, curve that you're going to use for Diffie-Hellman up a size. And if you use a really large system, you might have to bump it up really large to get the same uh, security level. And then our nice little uh, forget the sign thing, that's a bug in the slides. Um, our nice little hash, yes, it does cost us some things, but it gives us really better performance. And this is where tight security proofs might actually do some good. Okay, uh, you might quibble with the choice of curves, blah, 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 but the idea is essentially correct. Uh, but obviously, I was still working in a model where the adversary had promised me not to tamper with, his message, with my messages, and that's not actually realistic. So if he doesn't keep that promise, my protocol obviously fails. It falls to exactly the same man in the middle attack as, as ordinary Diffie-Hellman, so we're, we're nowhere. Um, the natural answer is to use signed Diffie-Hellman. Um, the problem we now run into is, of course, that if we just throw any old signature scheme at this protocol, we no longer have a tight security proof because any old signature scheme doesn't have a tight security proof. What do I mean by tight security proof for uh, signature schemes? Well, first of all, for ordinary signatures, the signature game that we're all used to, that we learn in basic cryptography, well, it only considers a single key. And to see why we get non-tight if we want to consider many keys, consider, for instance, RSA signatures. Well, every one of the users are going to have their own RSA modulus. That's kind of how RSA signatures work. Um, and which one are you going to get the adversary to factor? Well, you get at least a one over n. And in this interactive key exchange, where we actually have to guess both parties who might be corrupted, we get n square security loss. When we have to move to a situation where not only do we have many keys, but we also have adaptive corruptions. So we're going to have to do something with signatures as well. And that is, believe it or not, substantially more complicated. Because of all of these obstacles, right? I'm just redoing the argument that we all heard in the previous talk. So um, this is all straightforward. All the obstacles. Here is the idea. This is an idea that appeared at TCC 15. Um, the idea is to use a double signature thing. And it, you've kind of already heard the idea. Um, so what we want is for every user to have two public keys. One of them is his real key. That's the one he's going to actually use to sign. And the other is a fake key. And whenever he wants to sign something, he's going to sign it with the real key 
and is going to fake a signature for the fake key. The idea in this is that the real signatures and the fake signatures and the real public key and the fake public key, they are going to be indistinguishable. So, since the adversary can't tell them apart, when the adversary says, I'd like to get your secret key, we're going to give him the real key. We can do that because we have the real key of the real key. That's very easy, and he doesn't really expect there to be a key for the fake one, so who cares? So he gets what he wants. But we're going to put our difficult, hard problem into the fake keys. Because the real key and the fake key are indistinguishable, when the adversary makes his forgery that's going to allow us to do an extraction, he can't tell the real key and the fake key apart. He can't tell which is which. Which means that when he creates his forgery, it's going to be a forgery for the fake key with probability one half. Which means that every other time he's going to produce a forgery for the fake key, allowing us to do our extraction. So this is the existing idea, and it was used before in a uh, rather really nice uh, scheme that had lots of pairings and lots of whatever, and it's completely impractical. So what we did was, uh, let's forget about this pairing and all the nice stuff, let's just throw some random oracles at this and see if it sticks. Um, so we did, and we threw it at lots of different signature schemes and it didn't work because we need most of these signature schemes that you start with, which are um, tight with respect to lots of keys, just not adaptive corruptions, they use um, indistinguishable keys and then you distinguish keys instead of uh, extracting something. We need to be able to extract something because it, it's not, somehow it doesn't work with this uh, indistinguishable keys. So uh, we need to find a real system and then we found a system and this is uh, uh, somehow embarrassing. I use this system, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a real old system and I use it kind of to motivate um, uh, the development of zero knowledge proofs in my crypto course. And I say this is completely useless, of course. It's an old system. It's when you want to do discrete log based signatures in exactly the same way you do RSA signatures. You want to take the hash of a message, you raise it to your secret, and then some, in RSA, I mean, you have the public exponent, so everyone can check if you did, did this raising correctly. But in discrete logs, no one can do it. So somehow we need to get some way to check that this raising to my secret key was done correctly. And the way we do this, of course, is with a non-interactive zero knowledge proof. So we just prove that these two discrete logs are, equivalent, are, are the same. So this is a proof I stood in my crypto course and I said that this is a useless course and uh, system. And then a few weeks later, we suddenly realized this is what we need. This is always happens. Whenever you say something is useless in mathematics, it shows up somewhere being useful. So, uh, and this scheme, what we do here, and this is actually, I'm skipping a lot of details in this presentation, but the idea here is really simple. What we do is we just combine two signatures, and these are just, um, the signatures are just the hash raised to some power, uh, and then there is an, uh, an uh, equality of D log proof, and we just combine those proofs using the standard OR proof techniques that were developed in the 90s. These really old techniques that still work really well. So whenever you want to do this, you, um, you uh, uh, raise the real thing, real, the hash into your real key, and then you just choose a random element for the fake signature, and then you fake an equality of D log proof for the fake signature, and then you hash 
and do your Fiat Shamir and blah, blah, blah. And then you connect this and then you do the real proof for the real signature keys where you know the discrete logs are equal and you can do this equality proof. And of course, there are some details that you need to get right here, but this is essentially the idea. Throw random oracles at it and it works. We get a proof with tight uh, security. Of course, this scheme, well, we can't prove, we can't give a tight proof that we have strongly unforgeable signatures, so we only get existentially unforgeable, and this gives us problems when we go back and put those signatures in the key exchange, so we get lots of problems there as well. So everything is cascading into problems, but the end result is we get a really nice tight authenticated key exchange, and we get this uh, nice signature scheme. Of course, those of you who know what these proofs are and can count exponentiations, you have by now counted fairly high. Uh, you have counted almost as high as I have seconds left, so uh, let's go. Um, so if you look at some performance, we do not get the same really good performance here, but still, as the first thing you might even think about implementing, this is quite good. We are competitive, reasonably. And of course, there might be other applications where a signature scheme with a tight security proof is, uh, gives you a much bigger advantage. OK, so let me just reiterate. We have our first really practical, tightly secure signature scheme. We have a first practical, tightly secure, authenticated key exchange. and. If you go to really large-scale deployments, this is going to be more effective. I should also say, in fairness, these numbers where I didn't come off so well, I really gave this sign Diffie-Hellman every advantage because I used elliptic curve DSA, which doesn't really have a security proof. So it got some, some, something for free there. You should really, because the, the signature schemes that are as, a, as fast as uh, elliptic curve DSA they typically have very non-tight reductions, not just in the number of users, but also in the number of Oracle queries. So the numbers might be actually a lot worse. And if you move to uh, these schemes that are tight otherwise, well, then you um, get more exponentiations. So I show, get, show off, yep. Our results are better, really, than we showed off. So we were really modest here. Right. Questions? Thanks.